Does a crow do more damage than a rabbit? Andy and Gary are picking off fruit and some bunnies as they cruise past the polytunnels. Can you cut, David? Cut. <laughs> cut, I want to eat these. I want to eat these. Can you go? Plus, big, big news. We launch a brand new, simple to use, free shooting kit comparison website, KitFinder. It connects you to the UK's top dealers for the best service and prices on all the stuff you need in the field. Deer stalking, we are out with the UK Deer Tracking and Recovery Group. Fishing bands, we go to a Nottinghamshire lake where the local wildlife trust is trying to turf out the anglers. We're giving away game fair tickets. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. I wish you wouldn't shoot them so far. Oh, it smells amazing. He's not missing much, is he? He's, I know I said it just now, but he's bloody awesome. Yeah, he's awesome. It's that time of year when crops are about to deliver on their promise. Mm. What you don't want is something or someone eating the fruits of your labour. I wish you'd stop eating them, Dave, and do more filming. <laughs> Tonight, the challenge is to see if Andy, let loose on a fruit farm, oh, look at that can one. eat more than the rabbits he's here to control. These are strawberries in here. In the other polytunnels, they've got raspberries in. They're not so much of a problem on the strawberries. But they. I was going to say, these, they, these rabbits jump, do they, in order for the grab these stuff? No, they, they, they don't, David. They've got ladders. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but no, they, they've been uh, eating the barks on the, the raspberries, which are at the other end. But we just work our way through and uh, while it's light. And we did shoot here a couple of weeks ago with the 2 2, but we've shot them a few times now and they're getting a bit wise to the old job. So we've decided to use the 1 7 tonight so that we can shoot them. A bit further out, but it makes the job a lot easier, so that's the plan for tonight. This is actually our second attempt at making this rabbit shooting film. Our first outing was two weeks earlier when Paul from Infiray made the trip down south to set up Andy with some of their latest gear. I've only got one lens. I've only got one lens. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, so I'm so sorry. <laughs> What? Lucky you're only looking for that, oh yeah. Yeah, right, right so what have I got to do? Short press it. Yep. And then short press it again, yeah? Short press it, short Cousin press Gary it. Cousin Gary was yep. also on call, just in case. He's a bit more patient when it comes to this sort of thing. Clever stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Looks like it's a bit of a bloody... I know. <laughs> what was that, sir? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> what was that? What did you say? You can't see the pot. He said so something what, about what, what was that? <laughs> he, said something, he said something about a Schwarzschild, didn't he? I think, I think that's what he said. Not, did you uh... just say it? I thought it was better than my. What, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> that's not. <laughs> that is something else. Infiray's tube TD50L night vision scope is mounted on a very smart camo stocked R8 in 2.2. That is incredibly quiet, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah, it's like a misfire. <laughs> you know that one, didn't you? No more, I'll film it with Andy Crow. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> with everyone happy and Paul questioning his choice of evening's entertainment, it's time to head to our permission. It's a livestock farm where rabbit numbers are on the up and up. Unfortunately for us and our filming, so is the grass. The good weather has flushed it up and even though Andy bags a few, it's not the night we'd hoped for. Thankfully, we have a plan B. Go ahead, ready? And yeah. once Gary's in gear, we'll be off. You're, you're clearly not. <laughs> <laughs> what half the shade you got on? I've got half the shade on. Yeah. I'm It's a fun permission with aisles of opportunities and the chaps are keen to get out here and play. Is this pick your own? No, it's not, David. This is a commercial farm? It is commercial, yes. With Gary... <laughs> No, go for it, I can't 
About there. Yeah, David. No way. That's where they they got holes there as well, look. Yeah. Gary is on fire and his trusty Anschutz is picking off the rabbits at range, which means Andy has to put the legwork in. Did he have a night yeah. sight and stuff like that in the past? No, never did. No, yeah. no. Just had good scopes, you know, good lenses so that you could see in twilight. But, yeah. but this is a real game changer, really. And also I can go on my own. You know, I've got the buggy now. If I can't get a lamp, I can go on my own. Yeah. You haven't got to have a lamp. That's true. So, I hadn't thought about that. Well, that's, that was the reason, the you main reason I wanted. You don't be sociable anymore, Gary. Well, that suited me down to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> now, for those new to shooting, the 1.7 HMR and 2.2 rimfire rounds are ideal for rabbits, but they have good points and bad points. Here is a quick summary from Crow and Gary. In 30 seconds, Crowy, those that don't know, yeah. we've used a 2.2 and a 1.7 HMR. Yep. Quick difference. Um, everyone knows what my favourite is and Gary's. Uh, we used to love the 2 2, but with the 1 7, it's, it's lethal. They've both got their place, haven't they? Yeah, of course they have, yeah. So, of course so you've got a lot of rabbits yeah. close. Yeah, you've got close range rabbits. Uh, a lot of people shoot rabbits out at long range, but um, we have, as you've seen it, it's, it's snap shooting here tonight and uh, it's just straight on them. Okay, we've give got, me a pro of a 2 2. What's the pro for it? Silent. Okay, Tom. Ricochets in hard ground. Um, That's the worst thing. And the both, and that, that same thing then for HMR, 17 HMR? Uh, good out to 200 yards, uh, 150 no problem at all, especially in Gary or Gary's hands. Um, especially at night, you know, where you yeah. more difficult to judge the difference, the distance. Yeah, they're, they're, they're plumb on out, out to, well, 150 is zero. I mean, we've, we've got zeroed in, we've, we're confident out of 150. Okay, and a con? Uh, noise. Noise. But they don't take a lot of notice of it. Because yeah. if, if they hear it once, they're dead anyway, so. <laughs> That's right. And I suppose the cost then, isn't it? What's that? The cost a little bit, maybe, of the bullets. The cost is a bit, but the way rabbits are at the moment, they they, they pay for the bullets anyway. Okay, one seven's more expensive than 2-2. Yeah, okay, a lot, lot more expensive, but you kill more rabbits with them. In Gary's hands. Sure. These two are clearly enjoying themselves this evening, and even when David has to go to the night vision setting on his camera, the infrared is still super clear in the low light. Clear enough for shots like this. Ah, oh, shot. What an ambush. That's it. Doing all right, isn't he? Oh, love it. He's on, he's on, he's on, he's on fire. Some cracking right. shots. Yeah, it's getting quite dark now. It's quite handy, I'm finding them with this and... You can still see this in colour though. Yeah, that's right. right in front of we were using it the other night and it was a lot darker than this. And we can still see the strawberries and everything hanging in there red. Um, and Paul was saying that you can shoot with this to at least three quarters of an hour to an hour after dark. And, and we have been. He sent me a new IR down. We had an IR and it was a bit too bright. This one we can adjust it. So, um, yeah, well, we're going to try that in a minute. We're going to keep going around. We're just going to go back along the other end of the strawberries and come back. And uh, there seems to be a few in these raspberries, but it wants a little bit more dark, so they sit a bit tight. They've been now we shot on them a few times. They're a bit jumpy, sir. So. That's cool. Really yeah. good. Yeah, so good to go. When we lose the light completely, things get a bit trickier. Right, right. David's additional Wicked Light IR overpowers the tube, which comes with its own IR unit. We struggle to find a balance where Gary can shoot without glare and David can film through the Panasonic camera. We decide that's something for another night. These rabbits going to go to a good place? Yeah, they are. They're, they're pretty well sought after at the moment. Decent rabbits and I'll skip, I did one just a minute. I, I can't see that getting to the game, did I? I can see that going indoors. Really fat, lovely fat around the kidneys. So I'll be picking that one out. Um, but no. It was nice using the 1.7 tonight. Well, not for me, but I was having to go a long way to pick them up, but Gary had several there, well over 100 yards. Although they've shot thousands of rabbits between them, nice. they still love it, and it's great to see rabbits making a comeback. If you are looking for a new night vision unit in time for the crops coming off, you can find the best deals from the UK's best dealers for Infiray's Tube TD50L at kitfinder.co.uk. It retails for around £899. 
thanks to Andy and Gary. It comes to something when the pest controller does more crop damage than the pest. Right, you will have noticed a new sign-off at the end of that film. That's because today we're launching a new free-to-use shooting equipment search tool and deal comparison site called KitFinder. Instead of going to a website to look for shooting kit, you say what you want and the gun shops come to you. Roll the video. This is brand new. It's very clever and you've just got to have it. Buying new kit should be exciting and easy. But how many times have you been sent to outdated dealer listings and then onto websites not knowing if they hold stock, wondering if your details are going to be safe, and in the end having to phone around not knowing if you're getting the best deal? Well, not anymore. KitFinder is an independent comparison website aimed at hunters, finding you the best deals on hunting and shooting gear from all over the UK. Simply tell KitFinder what you're looking for and we'll get you the best deals from local and national retailers. Easily compare KitFinder deals by price, location, added value or reviews from previous buyers. Retailers are happy to answer your questions and you can even offer your kit in part exchange. We'll never share any of your details so you won't be hassled. Once you've ordered your kit directly from the retailer, you can collect it in store or arrange to have it delivered to your home or to your local gun shop. If you spot our kit finder QR codes out in the wild, scan them with your phone and we'll sniff out the best deals from across the UK for that particular product instantly. So try it now, it's completely free and you'll see why KitFinder is a hunter's best friend. KitFinder is designed to make your life easier. Say you fancy the Infiray TD50L that Andy's enjoying, or the Blaza 22 Rimfire, or a second-hand Anschutz 17 HMR. You can put in the hours searching for it with Google and by looking at the listings websites. KitFinder asks our network of UK dealers in one go. It puts gun shops from all over the country under one roof. So all you need to do is click on what you want and if they have it in stock, they respond to your kit request. And if they don't, we do our best to find out why from the distributors of that kit. As mentioned in the film, to make life even simpler, we will also uh, be offering kit-specific QR codes on all our social media, like this one. There are lots of ways of scanning these. If you're watching this on uh, the big screen, you can pause me, scan the QR code on your phone, and it will take you to a preloaded search. We, of course, will continue to add links to the descriptions below our films. This is not another listing site. You ask for what you want. The dealers respond simple. Talking of simple, Here's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The resignation of Boris Johnson as leader of the Conservative Party has triggered a leadership contest, which could see a change to policies and attitudes to field sports in England. Social media is already feeling the rumblings. Animal rights darling Zach Goldsmith tweeted that leadership contender Rishi Sunak will make Mark Spencer the next Secretary of State for DEFRA, whom he likens to Brazilian President Bolsonaro and calls grim news for nature. Former Chancellor and Yorkshire MP Sunak supports grouse shooting, so he could be a good win for shooters. The handful of Tory MPs who are in favour of animal rights are spreading their support. Sunak's main backer, Dominic Raab, is a patron of the Blue Fox Group of Conservatives against fox hunting. Another Blue Fox patron, Caroline Dynage MP, is backing Penny Mordaunt. And Henry Smith, member of Carrie Johnson's Conservative Animal Welfare Foundation and the MP, who plans a private member's bill to ban trophy imports, favours Suella Braverman. As anti-shooting MP George Eustace faces his last week as DEFRA secretary, his department has announced a three-year research project into game bird release. 
It is partnering with its own Natural England and Plant Health Agency departments to look at the scale of game birds releasing on and around sites in England. It will also look at the dispersal behaviour of animals released in Europe too. The impact of the study on soil and ground flora is part of the programme. Predation on reptiles, amphibians and invertebrates by game birds will also be under the spotlight. The influence of released game birds on local predator populations will also be included in the research. In 2020, while Justice forced DEFRA to review how game bird releases on or near European protected sites are managed, it found negative effects of game bird releases up to 500 metres from the point of release and did not acknowledge the conservation benefits of shooting. A British shooting champion is the face of a new initiative to get more people involved in the sport. Ruth Mwandumba is two times English 10 metre air rifle champion and the first black woman to represent England in ISSF shooting disciplines. She's working with British Shooting on its hashtag target change campaign, which is designed to change the perceptions of target shooting and bring more people into it. British Shooting has teamed up with the Women's Sports Alliance and Ely to give the initiative a wider reach. It's not just about diversity, it's just like we basically just want to encourage more people to get involved in the sport and educate people about the sport because um, when I've been speaking to people about shooting not a lot of people know that it's an Olympic sport and so for me that was a, one of the key issues, I just wanted people to know about it and let them know what we do. Um, so hopefully with this initiative people become more aware of the sport and they're more keen to get involved and we're going to be running a load of sessions as well um, just to let people try it out and hopefully encourage them to, to take it up. The Scottish Countryside Alliance is asking Scots to make their voices heard on the future of land reform. The Scottish Government has launched a consultation on how land should be bought, sold, used and managed. The Scottish Countryside Alliance is one of the many field sports groups taking part in the consultation. It's encouraging everyone in Scotland to have their say. Now, sports and estates have been bringing an awful lot of money into Scotland for a lot of years. So if there is a change of land use, it has to equate to at least the same, if not more, amount of financial income into Scotland. And it has to give security to these people. The second thing I would ask is that there is full engagement with any interested party, stakeholder and most definitely the local community. A popular North London shooting ground is closing down. The A1 shooting ground just inside the M25 near Boreham Wood has a history going back nearly 100 years and was originally owned by the famous London gunmakers Boss & Co. Claudio and Teresa Capaldo took over in 1994 and have built up the ground with a new clubhouse and layouts for sporting, DTL, ABT and Olympic trap. They recently installed an automatic helice layout. The CPSA registered ground will now close forever at the end of this month. The family blames increasing pressure from property development nearby for the closure. Under a new scheme, farmers in Wales must plant trees to qualify for any new grants. They will have to plant 10% of the land and also agree to set aside a further 10% for biodiversity. Rural Affairs Minister Leslie Griffiths has outlined the requirements in a document called a Sustainable Farming Scheme. The new scheme could be phased in from 2025, though it's not clear how much farmers will get. The NFU has reservations. The Welsh Government says the outline has been published to allow it to consult farmers on the proposals. Thanks to Jeff Smith for the story. More than 3,000 people have signed a petition by the Countryside Alliance to counter extremist attacks by antis. Its main target is the Wild Moors Animal Rights Group. Wild Moors is lobbying Yorkshire Water not to renew the shooting lease on Thornton Moor near Bradford. A review is considering if shooting of grouse and partridge can continue on land near Ogden Water, where the lease ends later this year. The Countryside Alliance claims the Wild Moors is running a divisive campaign based on misinformation. There's a link to the online petition in the description below. Basque is entertaining thousands of youngsters on its annual Let's Learn More Days. Children and teachers from all over England are joining gamekeepers to gain a deeper insight into how the countryside works. They're getting a first-hand account of how important habitat wildlife management is, as well as lessons in preventing wildfires and predator control. With lots of hands-on activities for more than 3,000 children at eight locations throughout the summer, Basque will be explaining the important role shooting communities play in conservation. The kids have learnt about 
the iconic curlew. They've learnt about soaring raptors. They've learnt about spongy sphagnum mosses. They've learnt about water and the precious water that rains on our uplands and then the flow is slowed down towards local communities. They've learnt how uplands and peatlands can help to tackle climate change and how the shooting community is a key part driving that forward. An English firing range has shut its doors after nine staff were treated for poisoning. Media reports claim employees received hospital treatment for lead poisoning linked to their work. The new UK Health Security Agency has launched an investigation into the double juice firing range in Walsall, which is currently closed. The agency says it is checking a recent change to ventilation at the building. It adds it is working with Walsall Council and an environmental health officer has visited the premises. The Environment Minister for Zambia, Collins Nzorvu, has spoken out in support of international trophy hunting. He says that hunting tourism benefits communities and supports wildlife conservation. He is pleading for the international community not to introduce trophy hunting bans. The minister says Zambian hunting communities share 50% of the hunting revenues. This incentive encourages rural communities to value wildlife. He fears that without it, locals could help poachers kill big game such as rhinos, elephants, leopards, lions and buffaloes. Meanwhile, Zimbabwe's hunting industry expects to attract more visitors this year than before the coronavirus pandemic, even as the war in the Ukraine and other economic challenges weigh on the numbers of other tourists. The New Zealand government is launching the world's largest attempt to eradicate small predators. The four-year plan targets rats, possums, feral cats and hedgehogs on the island of Rakiura, also known as Stewart Island. The mission to make it predator-free will cost around £1.5 million. Two local conservation industry bodies will pick up the cash. That's £3.40 per acre, which is considerably better value than the £1,000 per acre that the RSPB is earning from the taxpayer and national lottery to do the same job in Rathlin Island off Northern Ireland. And finally, a hero hound donates blood to save a pet poodle. Harrison from the Worcestershire Hunt was drafted in to help Chloe survive an emergency procedure. Henwick vets performed the operation. Chief Vet Kirsty Kane says there are strict criteria for canine blood donations, which include being a certain weight, being fully vaccinated and having a good temperament. Harrison fitted the bill and Chloe is now making a good recovery. You are now up to date. I always wanted to be a gamekeeper right from day one. My father's a gamekeeper, but I always wanted my own business, so it's evolved from being employed to now being an employer. Um, having lads working for me, but I'm still very much involved and uh, get my hands dirty. If you have a tyre that is just for one job, it's no good for the other job. And that's, you know, the truck behind is basically, it's a, a vehicle I need on the road and I need it for doing, you know, shoot days and stalking as well, so it's off-road. So it's no good having a, a big chunky tyre on it. You've got to have a best of both worlds. So luckily, 50-50, it works a treat. This is a big responsibility, carrying that many people in, in, in the gun trailer. You've got beaters, guns, it sounds silly, but you have a puncher on a day, you haven't got an hour to lose. Because you are driving onto the road, then you're straight off onto like, tracks and stuff, you know, you need something that's reliable, so basically the day can be as, as safe and as smoothly run as possible. Now, James Marchington has been off to find out about a growing area of dog work in the UK, the deer tracking and recovery groups. With the best will in the world, a shot deer doesn't always drop on the spot. Usually the stalker can find it quickly. But if not, who are you going to call? Maybe it'll be Isla the Black Lab. Isla is 14 months old and training to be registered with the UK Deer Tracking and Recovery Group with her owner, Nobby Clark. I've got one dog on already. He's, uh, he's an eight year old. And this one's gonna be my, my next tracking dog, her, the replacement for the one I've got at the moment. Head of the group is Tony Lowry. We provide a, a free service for, um, 
for stalkers um, when things go wrong, if they haven't got their own dog, and sometimes if they have got their own dog. So how do you train a dog to follow a wounded deer? Well, someone has to play the part of the deer, and today that role falls to Rob Eames. He wears these special shoes with the feet of a freshly shot deer clamped behind the heels. Tony checks the settings on his GPS, and we're off. We've laid a track which is probably four or five hundred yards long with two or three turns in it and try to make it as realistic as possible with um, minimal blood. There's no more than 50 mil of blood in that pot which Rob's, Rob's been using. We expect uh, all our handlers to pass a test which is at least 20 hours old. So this test this morning is for a puppy really. It's a young dog test and they have to pass that before they go on to a 20 hour test. Um, so obviously, and you've got to put the time into your dog. They've got to be quite experienced. It's a combination of everything I'm looking for. I'm looking at what the dog's doing, the reactions from the dog, so I can know whether she's on or off the track. Uh, as we go along the track, I'm looking for sign as well. There may be some blood. There's some blood down there and some hair. Yeah. Or other signs along the way, possibly a wound bed where the, the deer's run so far, laid down and stayed there and something's moved it on, there'll be... I'm looking for all these signs all the way through. I'm also looking ahead of the dog, in case I see the deer... The blood on this tree! ...maybe dead in front of us, which in which case we've got no problem. But if it's alive and getting up in front of the dog, I've then got a situation which I need to deal with. Am I going to release the dog to chase it, or call the dog back in and take a shot at that deer? It's all about minimising the, the suffering from the deer, so I don't want to keep tracking it pushing and pushing and pushing the deer. If it's dead at the end of the track, then it's easy. But we, we train to deal with uh, a live deer as well, the dogs and, and the handlers. All she's doing is associating the, the smell of the deer to a reward at the end. Doesn't think so much of, I'm following a muntjac or I'm following a fallow. She's following a smell that she is associating with the reward that comes at the end of the at the end of it. Her reward is normally a, a leg and some food. Being a Labrador, she likes the old, likes the food. Come on then. Yeah, that was clever. That was clever. Was it, was it clever. It's one of the most important bits of the training is the, is the reward at the end. You've got to make a big fuss. So they really want to get to the end. For a young dog, I was quite happy with that. She's. Struggled on a few bits where it went from like a lot of vegetation, which is quite easy to, uh, to track across. There was a, the track there where it's hard and dry and bare. We seemed to struggle a little bit until we actually got across the track and then we were off again. We went from the vegetation to the dry mode grass. It makes it a lot harder for her because yeah, part of the scent picture that she's following is going to be the bit of disturbance. So the green vegetation's easier to track on than it is on the hard packed dry ground. She sort of went left to right and then all of a sudden went, turned left very sharply, very quickly, which was different to what she'd been doing around the rest yeah. of the field. That's part of reading the dog. Yeah. I mean, there's a few other points where we struggled a little bit. Uh, and when she was back on, her nose goes down and she just pulls as opposed to having a few steps up it. Not really pulling too hard, nose comes up, but when she goes back onto it, the nose goes down, she pulls hard and just keeps pulling. Which, uh, for me at the moment, the stage of training that she's at, that tells me she's back on the track. No, on the whole, I'm quite happy with that for the stage she's at in her training now, so... Uh... Part of the handler's training is to analyse the simulated shot site. It's a sort of stalking CSI. So here we've got um, a conical shaped bone, which Again, this, this is quite a typical sort of scenario of a, of a lower leg shot where you don't get a lot at the actual shot site. You might get a tiny bit of blood, short hair off the lower leg. Um, the round bone is a good indication that it's been shot sort of lower down in the leg as opposed to ribs, which are a, a flat bone. If you sort of talked about um, a normal chest shot um, where you're going to be hopefully hitting lungs, there's going to be probably a bit more blood um, sprayed out around the back there. You can have longer hair from the, from the side of the deer. Um, you might find a tiny bit of rib bone, um, not that often. 
but it, it's more the small chunks of lung and you know the nice bright blood um, things where you might get um, a gut shot or liver the blood's going to be a lot darker um, if you've caught the liver but the main bit is going to be whether you see stomach content which would be a green and which for a dog to find is pretty easy because because of the smell that's coming off of it the flies are actually you know they're really on to any blood and bits and pieces like that especially um, a gut shot this time of year there'll be flies on it within minutes um, and again it can be a quite a real handy thing in actually locating a shot site. They're not always going to be dead and occasionally just track them to a dead deer. Uh, sometimes they'll, be a, they'll still be alive. So rather to try and stop extending suffering, it may involve a chase or on a mobile deer. And when they get to the end, they need to be able to deal with it. Uh, some of the dogs here you've just seen have been baying, as in, barking and hold the deer in one position. They'll move around barking and just keep that deer there until we can get there to dispatch the deer. Some of the dogs will naturally bay and then grab hold of the deer. But it's the dog's character that will determine that, not, not necessarily the training. I mean, some of them have got that, that aggression and that confidence to take a deer down, whereas others will just Bay. Either one works for us, but it's, it's dealing with that live deer at the end and it will give us a chance to control the situation, slow it all down and then safely dispatch the deer should it be alive at the end of the track. We teach them to, well I use a leave command, but whatever command it is to, to come off that deer is part of what we need them to do. <laughs> part of what we need them to do. Yeah. You don't particularly want to be shooting over the dog. Yeah, sure. um, we don't want to be wrestling with the deer. Some situations you need to use a knife. So we don't want dog and deer still wrestling and a knife flying about or yeah. trying to shoot the deer with a dog still attached. We need that certain, the, a basic level of obedience to have the control of the dog to if, hold it in place for us to be able to deal with it. And when we've got, calmed down, Everything's under control. We can call the dog off and then dispatch the deer. So what's the message Tony wants to get out to stalkers across the UK? Basically, if you're a stalker and you haven't got your own dog or you have got your own dog and you think what's happened is beyond your dog, then please give, give us a call and we will come out and do our best to find it. By all means, go and investigate the shot site. It may give you some idea where the animal's hit. Um, it's not always where you think it's hit sometimes. But, um, yeah, give us a call and we'll try and help. Next, our news feature brought to you as usual by the Field Sports Nation, who have been busy testing Kitfinder for us for the last couple of weeks. Thanks very much to all of them. They get their weekly TV show on Tuesday's Field Sports Extra. And that's how we tell them about our weekly prize draw. This week, it's for 10 tickets to the Game Fair, 10 lucky winners who may well be going already with their free bass tickets, who will now be able to bring a wife, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, or a gender neutral life partner. Who knows, doesn't matter. The point is they will get in for free as well. Find out how you can join the Field Sports Nation in the description below. And crucially, the Field Sports Nation pays for our news features this week. We have found a wildlife trust in Nottinghamshire that's trying to kick out anglers from a lake. Deborah investigates. Angling is a gentle sport. In Nottinghamshire, fishers are showing they can also be tough when their sport is threatened. The threat? Their new landlord, the local wildlife trust. Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust purchased the Attenborough Nature Reserve in December 2020. Now groups, including the Angling Trust and the Countryside Alliance, are fighting to save the right to fish there. The Nottingham Anglers Association have been fishing the Ashenborough Reserve, and it's a big, big reserve, a famous place for fishing, for well over 20 years and, and, and others before that. It's a 380-acre site, and slowly but surely the people managing that reserve, once the Wildlife Trust took over a few years ago, started squeezing the anglers out. 
And we got to the stage that in 380 acres, from a time when they were able to fish the whole of the reserve, uh, which is just off the, of the Trent, uh, close to Nottingham, um, they were down to 25 pegs, literally a tiny proportion of, what, of the water that was left uh, was, was allowed for anglers. And so whilst angling hasn't actually been banned, what they've effectively done is squeeze the angling club out. And it's quite obviously part of a deliberate policy by Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust to ensure they have no angling whatsoever on their reserves, even when it's taken place there for generations. And uh, that's in marked contrast to other wildlife trusts, uh, many of whom uh, encourage and even sell tickets for angling. There's always a ripple effect to anything that's, that, that comes about. So if somebody, if, if one organisation does it, then it, it, by dint of what they're doing, it's going to probably concertina out to others. So we have to look at this and we actually have to nip it in the bud very, very quickly because if this is allowed to go on, then one of the nation's favourite sports is going to really reap a very bitter harvest. Martin says anglers are key to wildlife conservation. Well, we think it's very regrettable. We, we actually think that, uh, and we've said this in our correspondence with the new chief executive of Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust, anglers have far more in common with people who are actively out there trying to enhance and preserve the environment uh, than, than, than we ever have in terms of issues that might divide us. Uh, that's why we, we, we work with wildlife trust in the past on, on, on issues that would be damaging to angling and to, to the watercourses and to the wildlife and to the wetlands. Uh, we think it's immensely short-sighted and I suspect what has happened that unlike other wildlife trusts where fishing is allowed, I think there's probably an extremist element uh, that of, of uh, holding sway within that particular wildlife trust up in Nottinghamshire uh, that want to push forward and make sure no angling occurs on, on any of their sites. Uh, and that's a policy that we are going to stand firm and challenge and we want to see it reversed. We think it is completely unacceptable that wildlife trusts that get money from public purses should be discriminating against a perfectly lawful sport which governments of all political persuasions accept is a force for good. The newly elected chairman of the Angling Trust, Sir Charles Walker MP, has raised the issue at Westminster. And during that debate, can we celebrate those enlightened wildlife trusts that promote angling and call? And, and can we call out those such as the Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust, which states on its website that it has a long-standing policy of not allowing angling on any land for which it holds the angling rights? Uh, this recently brought it into conflict with the Nottinghamshire Anglers Association that last week was banned from the Attenborough Nature Reserve. Can I just say to the Leader of the House, anglers like me love our rivers and streams as much as football fans love their club, clubs. It is a visceral relationship and Wildlife Trust should not get in between it. Nottinghamshire is not the first Wildlife Trust to try to do this. Kent Wildlife Trust tried and failed to evict Bromley Anglers Association from lakes at Seven Oaks. We come out of this on the track record of overturning a much more vehement, if you like, angling ban uh, by the Kent Wildlife Trust down in Seven Oaks last year, uh, which I think we covered on this channel. Um, so, you know, Angling Trust has got a pretty good track record of standing up for anglers' rights and challenging successfully uh, uh, restrictions or angling bans such as this. The Angling Trust and the Countryside Alliance promote angling's many health benefits. The value that angling as a, as a, not just a recreation, but also something that helps mindfulness, well-being, and it's even, for goodness sake, it's even been um, offered by doctors as a way to get over certain mental health issues. So, you know, there is a value in what we do, not just in the natural world. Well, on the health uh, aspect first, it's been acknowledged by the NHS, by the Home Office, um, and you can see by the number of, of, of social prescribers that, that push people with all sorts of issues to deal with towards angling is a very, very beneficial activity. It was also acknowledged in that exchange in the House of Commons between Sir Charles Walker, MP, who's soon to be the new chairman of the Angling Trust, and the leader of the House, Mark Spencer, 
MPs from right the way across the political spectrum are united that angling is a force for good, that it's a beneficial activity, has multiple benefits in terms of, of mental health, uh, uh, social development, and of course it teaches a, a, lot of, a lot of people about the importance of having a clean and healthy environment. Uh, it is clean rivers uh, and a clean environment and a healthy environment and, and maximum biodiversity uh, that creates the environment upon which our sport depends. So anglers are absolutely up there uh, with people who, who champion environmental issues. That's why it's so regrettable to see Wildlife Trust taking this, this very blinkered attitude towards us. In a statement, the Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust says, following the decision by Nottinghamshire Anglers Association not to renew their option on the fishing rights at Attenborough Nature Reserve, Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust announced a 12-month suspension of all fishing permits at the site. Despite the Trust's long-standing policy of not allowing angling on land for which it holds rights, the Trust was open to renewing the arrangement with the NAA due to our long working relationship, subject to a reduction in the number of fishing spots or pegs, in keeping with the charity's objectives of managing the reserve, a site of special scientific interest. The Nottinghamshire Angling Trust is meeting with the Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust to fight for the right to continue fishing on the 28th of July 2022. We have Nottingham, Nottingham Anglers Association preparing a plan uh, to deliver uh, angling, not on the whole of the wildlife reserve, but on a, a far larger proportion of the reserve in a more suitable location uh, at a price that is sensible and fair to everybody. So we will be putting proposals back uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the trust to get angling back on Attenborough in a way that now allows their objectives to be uh, realised um, and also allows the club to have uh, a decent access to a reasonable amount of water at a fair price. For more about the Attenborough Gravel Pits, visit the Nottingham Anglers Association website, nottinghamanglers.co.uk. And for our story about Bromley Anglers Association's victory, go to fieldsportschannel.tv forward slash Kent Wildlife Trust. Thanks, Deborah. Now from ponds in the Midlands to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is with James Marchington, Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the top hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Peter Jones sends us this one with him and Paul Simons of the Capriolas Club out to shoot a roe deer with a pre-war 303 Lee Enfield. Field Sports Channel regulars Andy Crow, Dan Thorpe, Paul Childerley and Wayne Martin are shooting the Jack Pike English Open at sporting targets. Good shooting and plenty of banter. David from Predator Protection UK fixes a surprise birthday present for a keen 18-year-old who was confined to a wheelchair and told he'd never walk again, but is now about to start a course at Sparshold. Dave Carey is at Beaver Castle, double gunning on driven ducks and showing that steel shot is perfectly capable of clean kills if you put it in the right place. On the other side of the world, RJM Hunting Australia is shooting feral pigs on contract using a thermal scope on a moderated 308 rifle. In Zimbabwe, the Smith brothers are hunting Cape Buffalo and Elephant in this hour-long film which goes into detail about the benefits to conservation and local people. Here's an unusual one, a film shot in 360 of a bow hunter calling in and shooting a buck in South Dakota. If you watch it on your phone, you can move it around to scan the scene. Finally, back to the UK, where DJ Decoys is guiding a client on pigeons, shooting over standing wheat with the aid of flappers and a magnet. They have a good day and make a bag of 80. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. That's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can just like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our register page. Of course, if you want to buy something, go to kitfinder.co.uk. This show, Field Sports Britain, is at 7pm UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. <laughs>